Welcome in. It is Big Ten today. It is great to have you with us on this Tuesday. Dave Revson, Dave Wanstead, I'm excited to pick your brain on week one. We finally got some games. I'm about. so excited not to be just looking into the crystal ball and saying, <laughs> I think this is going to happen. Now we got film. We got TV stuff that we've been watching. So, uh, yeah, a little more factual today. All right. Oh, I, you, are you implying somehow that there was a, an absence of fact? With me, there was. I mean, how do we, you know, guys transferring po- transfer portal and freshmen and new offenses and coaches. That's a lot to study it's a lot in, to that digest. in that crystal ball. If there's anyone who can digest it, though, <laughs> it is you. Let's get to our big story, and it is the week that was in Big Ten football. Three of the top seven teams in the preseason poll in the Big Ten East. All of them handily won their openers. Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State all prevailing by at least 20 points. The two ranked teams in the West, Wisconsin and Iowa, both winners as well. Maryland, Michigan State, Rutgers all turning in convincing wins. Scarlet Knights captured a conference game against Northwestern. I want to run through each of the ranked teams first, and then we'll get to some of those other teams later in the show. Let's start with Michigan. We know about the Jim Harbaugh storyline. It had been a big one going into the game. Truth be told, I don't think they're really going to need him here these first few weeks, although it's disruptive and we talked about the ways in in which it is. That being said, what did you take away from the Harbaugh-less Wolverines in that opener against ECU? Well, to start with, I thought they played relatively a clean game, and that's what you look for in a first game. You know, 12 guys on the field, you know, delay of games. I thought they handled that good. And you know what? You know, East Carolina, that's a tough team. When you're at Michigan – and you're not in that part of the country. It's a tough team to get your players to wrap their minds around, but they are an athletic, talented football team. They truly are. So what happened in the game, and it was really called perfectly, you know, the defense coordinator of East Carolina, he had to make a decision. Are we going to try to gang up on the run, or are we going to try to take away the pass? They said, let's commit to the run. So they did that, and J.J. McCarthy obviously lights them up. Outstanding debut, you know, for the season, throwing the ball. We know all the numbers. Uh, So that was perfectly played out, I thought, by Michigan's offense. And and you know what I loved about it? Afterwards at the press conference, you know, they're all sitting at the table right there talking. And and I think it was J.J. that that said it. It might have – I think he said it. You know what? We're going to – if we can have to run to win, we'll run to win. If we've got to throw the ball to win, we'll throw the ball to win. And uh, so, yeah, was there a running game? Not what we would think. You know, what, 3-9 a carry or something? But that's okay. That's fine. I mean, you know what? That, because when you win a game like this, Rever, you go in and you know what I'm talking to? I'm talking to our offensive linemen. And whether it's factual or not, this is a great opportunity for Jim Harbaugh to walk in there this week with the line coach and say, you guys are Joe Moore winners? And we ran for three yards a carry or three nine a carry. That ain't going to get it, guys, yeah. against the Ohio States and Penn States of the world. So it's a great opportunity to coach hard. And then defensively, I mean, they they showed up, you know, and, and, and made plays all over the field. So uh, I thought it was impressive. I really was from top to bottom against a good football team in the opener, really. Held ECU to 235 yards. So good defensive performance. They get UNLV this week. We'll see if they try to run the ball more. Again, as you say, a lot of that was dictated by the game plan of ECU. We know how good Michigan has been the last couple of years running the ball, but if you're going to pack that box, they can throw it on you, and and we saw that and saw the emergence of Roman Wilson as well. Ohio State conference game against Indiana. Yeah. The Hoosiers did a nice job defensively. Like, let's take our hat off to IU to start. I know there's been some consternation in Columbus. I don't think it's overwhelming consternation, but we know the history of quarterback play at Ohio State, and so I think you come into this thinking that Kyle McCord will just pick up where C.J. Stroud left off. We have to start there with the Buckeyes offense. What did you make of what was not an overwhelming performance? Certainly wasn't a bad performance against Indiana, but, you know, held under 400 yards. What would you take from it? Yeah, my take on it was sitting there watching the game, I'm thinking to myself, uh, okay, it was a win. And Ryan Day at Ohio State, God, I felt bad for him after the game because he's, he, he's apologizing for not winning 
with enough style points. You know, okay, we just won the game. It was the first game, new starting quarterback. But nobody wants to hear that. They expect you to win, and they expect you to win big. So the only question is, I would, I would ask Ryan, I would love to talk to him, and I may call him, and uh, say, <laughs> yeah. And, Will you conference me in when you call him? Okay. And, yeah. and, and yeah. truly ask him, why did you go to two tight ends what was your thinking there so much? I yeah. mean, they were in two tight ends, 35% of their offensive plays. 24 snaps, they were in two tight ends against Indiana. And usually when you get in a two tight end offense, it's going to be smash moth and you're going to just dominate the line of scrimmage. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. So what happens? You got to, you know, you say, why didn't you score enough points? Well, drives third and one and they, get, they lose three yards. Fourth and one, they go for it and throw an incomplete pass. That's two possessions that you're giving the ball back to Indiana, and that's two less possessions that Ohio State had to get on to get points. So that the two tight end thing, when you've got first-round draft pick receivers on the sideline, would they catch five balls? You know, yes, between, between Harrison and Labuka, they yeah, caught five two, balls. Five passes. So let me ask you this, though. Is that a tacit acknowledgement that maybe we're not as good up front as we need to be and that if we're going to gain any yard here, we need an extra blocker? Like, is that what they're saying? No. If I, I would look what's, at the, I would what's look, the... What's the idea behind going to a two tight end? Two side? tight end offense with me? We're going to two tight ends because, guys, we can dominate the line of scrimmage. We are going to block them, and this is power football. Now, the other side of the coin... Guess where they were at when, when uh, uh, Devin Brown gets tackled for a loss? He's in at quarterback at third and one. He's in the shotgun. He's trying to run power play out of the shotgun. To me, that makes no sense. So if you're going to get in two tight ends, come on, let's go. Let's 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 buckle up our chin straps. That didn't happen, Reverend. So you get yeah. two tight ends, which is a little contradictory to me. You're two tight ends. But yet you're in a shotgun. Uh, how, the- how hard is that, though? There's so many teams now that just run exclusively out of the shotgun. And, yeah. and I know, like, for old school Not coaches, me. you look at this and you say, you've you got to gain five yards just to gain a yard. Thank you. But, but that's who they are. And then when these guys get under center, they've never handled the snap, and then you get bad snaps. But you're, you, do you don't both. buy into that. Got to do both. I don't right. Fourth and one, get up under the center and go yeah. set hike on the first step. You'll make the first time. Let's talk on a p- real positive note. Their defense played a lot better than right. I was maybe anticipating. We talked about the talent that they had there, four stars, five stars. Could they come together? Boy, they sure did. One, one run over 11 yards, one pass, total over 20 yards. I mean, that's you know three points. That's, that's as good a defense. Against a talented offense in East Carolina, guys that can make plays, that's uh, – that, Indiana. Indiana. Oh, I'm sorry, Indiana. Indiana. Yeah. I mean, I, I was impressed. Defensively, they showed up and I thought played on all levels. Back end, front seven, pressures, uh, good performance by the defense. Do that in a conference game to start things out. 153 yards of offense for right. the Hoosiers. Got Youngstown State next week. You got two games here to figure it out. And then you got Notre Dame. And, and that's going to be a, a challenging game, no doubt. Penn State was in a bit of a battle early against West Virginia. Missed field goals, hurt them early on in this game, but ultimately pulled away. And Drew Aller is the biggest story, I wow. would think, coming out of this game. Certainly was in my mind. What, what did you a- learn abs- about watching him? Absolutely. And I, and I would start with James Franklin. Congratulations. Uh, how about no turnovers and one penalty? And this West Virginia team, there's a lot of pressure on the head coach. But this, this is kind of a rivalry. I mean, these, you can drive back and forth. This used to be a yearly game back yes. and forth, yeah. you know, when I was at Pitt. And, and so this is an emotional game for the fans. And I thought West Virginia really laid it on the line, and Penn State met that challenge across the board in all areas. Yes, we're talking about Aller. I mean, he had a big day. We know the numbers. But when they had to run the ball, and this is what I love. They got down there close. They line up. They run the, the bounce play. And uh, Singletary, he just bounces it outside, makes a guy miss. So you're sitting there saying, wow, the passing game and the quarterback, you know, first time starting for, for Sean Clifford, outstanding. But, boy, there's those young running backs now that have matured and know the offense and got more confidence. So I, I thought offensively, uh, outstanding, outstanding, right across the board. I don't know what more you could ask them. 
This is going to be a really difficult offense to defend now, right? I mean, Keandre Lambert-Smith has looked the part of a number one receiver. You go back to the Rose Bowl. Yep. Last year he was really good. He was very good in this one. A couple of the transfers showed up nicely, so they, they seem to have kind of firmed up that receiving group. Aller is a big-time QB. And then you talk about Singleton and Katron Allen. I mean, these are big-time backs. We saw it a year ago, and so all of a sudden here – it's multidimensional. Now, defensively, were they quite where you would expect well, them to well, be? Well, you know, the, the bright spot for me, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as pressure on the passer yeah. and coming up with negative tackles for losses, they, they exactly, because that's yeah. a real good offensive line, I might say, for West Virginia. A real good offensive line. The guy that I got to give some love to, Curtis Jacobs. You know what I mean? A five-star recruit coming out, and people are talking about him maybe being the next – Parsons, you know, Micah Parsons, right. and it really had, for whatever reason, and now he showed up big, 10 tackles in this game, so he, he, he that's good for him. That's, that's a great shot in the arm, not just for the defense, but for himself personally. Three sacks, six tackles for loss, and James Franklin really complimentary of West Virginia's offense afterwards, and yes. saying he thinks that's an offense that's going to give people some problems, so, I mean, to put up the, the defensive numbers that they did against a, a, an offense that might turn out being to be pretty good is is impressive. Delaware this week for Penn State, so that one does not figure to be a major challenge. Uh, Wisconsin, as we move over to the West ranked teams, we heard a lot about the air raid, Wani. Do I not forget. It. Do not forget about the ground game. I sat right here. If Jacob could find the tape, we probably and said last week that. The biggest that Phil Long, the offensive coordinator, right? Yeah. That they hired from North Carolina, they led the ACC in rushing. Okay, so right. don't lose sight. Everybody, I, I think this was a great team win for Luke Fickle and for Wisconsin. But you know what else? It was a great win of relief for the fans. Oh, you know, the Barry Alvarez, the Brett Beal, you know. Our, no, I'm serious. No, I agree. These, well, I think I agree these people you. were I, I think, panicked. They were scared to death that they were going to throw well, it 60 I, times. I, so, I think, well, it's been interesting to gauge Wisconsin fans this offseason. I actually think <laughs> most of them are thrilled with this notion. of. And Phil Longo said, like, when he came in, he said, hey, we run the ball. And I would be foolish to come in with this offensive yep. line and those running backs and not run the ball. And to your point, he had he ran the ball a lot in North Carolina. But I also think that there is excitement. Like they've been a middle of the road offense here over the last few years. And I think there's excitement that there's an expanded passing game. And we saw some of that. And I think you know, Mordecai's numbers would have been better had he not had a, oh, yeah. a sure touchdown pass dropped early on in the game. But they love that stable of receivers. So I, I, I hear you. I think the consensus was we don't want to abandon what we've been here and been really successful right. for 30 years, but it would be nice to expand upon it. Well, like Bill Parcells told me once, Dave, all these offensive coordinators are going to tell you they believe in the running game. Very few of them do. That was proof that yes. he does believe in the running game. 312 right? yeah. So that's outstanding. And you're talking about uh, Morka, I mean, 24-31, even with that drop. I mean, that's outstanding. And defensively, you know, they held Buffalo, who, you know, who's a, 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 a commendable team in the MAC. I mean, they held them to two, two out of 12 conversions on third down, which means they're getting that ball back for the offense. So – uh, complete game, great win for Luke and his staff, and a great sigh of relief to those those Wisconsin fans. Really challenging game this week going to Washington State. Remember, yes. Washington State beat them in Madison last year. Washington State was fabulous in its opener against Colorado State. So that's going to be a challenge. We're going to see where they are, yep. both sides of the ball, uh, against Wazoo. Uh, Iowa and Utah State, there have been so much focus on Iowa this uh, offseason, the addition of Cade McNamara, the questions about offensive production. Yeah. I, uh, yeah? Yeah, you're, well, you're, I hate you're the, ele your head. the elephant in the room. I hate even – I mean, everyone's talking about Brian Ferentz. Are they scoring enough points? Are they going to – I mean, come on. I mean, Kurt Ferentz people, I, I would just say relax. I mean, the, the guy – is outstanding. I'd want my grandson going playing for Kurt Ferentz. I mean, right. that's the type of staff they got and people and, and the players that they produce out of Iowa. And and Kurt said it. Yeah, would they they kicked the field goal? It could have at the end. Could have kicked the field goal. And, and, and what yeah, did he say? That's not my style. Right. That's not who we are. So he's not going to fall into that trap. He's going to go out and have his t 
team prepared, and try to win the game. But, hey, Cade McNamara will make a huge difference. And, and that defense, you know, we forget about the Jack Campbells of the world that they graduated. Van Ness, you know, I mean, yeah. some, some first-round first pick. Yeah. First-round pick, two guys. So it's going to take a little bit of time to bring this defense around. And um, the biggest thing that and, – and, and Kurt, I got to tell you this now. We know that his background is offensive line. I mean, when you look at here, I mean, I was disappointed in the run game. Even, okay, Cade's out of it. You want to keep protect him. Rever, 88 yards yeah. rushing on 36 carries. And would they give up six or seven tackles for loss, meaning you're getting hit in the backfield? Uh, you know, that, that's, that's got to be driving Kurt Ferentz. That's, to me, the focus. we got to get the offensive line and the running game going. If we get that going, that'll make our defense better. That'll help Cade. You know, that's the key. Get this run game and offensive line scored away. I'm with you. There's been a lot of talk about kind of what's gone wrong these last two years on offense. To me and to Kirk Ferentz, I think, and to Brian, like the offensive line has not been where it has been historically. They seemed pretty confident when we were at practice that that would be different this year. So, and, and it looked better yeah. when we were there. The guys were moving better than, than a year ago. So we'll see. I, I tend to believe part of it is, you know, we parachute in for one day and you see them and, and right. you try to extrapolate and draw all kinds of conclusions. It did seem like a better group. I know Howard and Jerry both thought it was a better group. But you also listen to what coaches tell you and what they've been emphasizing and what they've seen. And both those guys said it's going to be better. So my tendency is to believe people when they tell yeah. you that. So I, let's, I, let's I see. Let's see how it looks against Iowa State. This week, and, you know, it's a game that has been a, a back-and-forth rivalry uh, through the years. The, the Cyclones won it last year. Iowa's had, the, had its way in aim, so you, you we'll know, see. You Meaningful know game for they, people they in the state get, of Iowa. Get a back that's a little bit of BYOB, be your own blocker. That always helps. Right. Somebody just miss and go, you know? No doubt, but, but you would also just say – Iowa, historically, Kurt you would Ferentz. expect you don't have to do that. Kurt Ferentz, Kurt Ferentz yeah, yeah, NFL, right. That's, right. that's the feeding ground, right. absolutely. So, one game. We're not going to take too much out of one game, but, but seem like they're on the right track. Illinois pulling out a week one win in dramatic fashion over the reigning MAC champ Toledo. After the Rockets took the lead in the final three minutes, Illinois gets a dramatic fourth down conversion. Luke Altmaier to Casey Washington. Caleb Griffin then winning it with a 29-yard field goal, 30-28 to 28 in favor of the Illini. Coach, a nail-biter against a very good team. Again, they won the MAC last year. They're picked to win the MAC this year. That being said, this is an Illinois team that has aspirations of winning the Big Ten West. So it's the kind of game you expect to win if you're going to be a good team. They did win it. Wasn't always pretty, but coming away with a W, what does it mean? Well, it, 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 we were talking earlier, you know, this is something, a game like this, uh, you can't stand up there and read it out of a book. Guys, we're going to be behind and we're going to have to come up from behind in the end and win this game and you're going to have to make plays. I mean, that, that all sounds good. The only way for the players to really digest this and be able to take something meaningful from it is to go through it. So going through a game like that where you didn't play your best, and in some areas you were maybe but not played a little bit, right. uh, and still find a way to win, I mean, that's something that you build on. And now you can be real critical. I mean, if I'm Brent Bielman, I'm going in there with my defense right off the bat. Guys, we're number one scoring defense in the league. We got our two, Randolph and Newton, you're our two guys. You got no sacks. We got no tackles for loss. We, we're not going to win the Big Ten championship with that type of performance. So we got to get this solved. But offensively, uh, and Brent mentioned the penalties, you know, 10 penalties. I mean, you, you, that's nine in the first half. Nine in the first and half. And then the 10th one almost cost them the game. Yeah, do that, yeah. Do that against, you know, Wisconsin's of the world. You'll, you'll get beat. You got right. no chance. And Brent knows that. Uh, offensively, though, you, you mentioned Luke Altmar. I mean, that was impressive what he did, I thought, passing the ball. But also with his legs, you know, Tommy DeVito last year was a drop-back passer. Scramble once in a while. 69 yards rushing out of your quarterback, and you know they're going to line up and pound the football, okay, with Reggie Love and McCray and those guys. So you know that. So if I'm a defensive guy and I'm looking at Illinois' offense right now, okay, I, I know they want to run the ball and be physical. That's what they've always done. But, boy, now the quarterback, this guy, we've got to take into account an athletic quarterback 
And I bet you Brent's watching that tape now and saying, you know, let's add a play or two where we get our quarterback, you know, in, in some space running the ball right. in addition to throwing it. So offensively, I thought they did a good things. Defensively, to me, that that's not the standard. And I guarantee you, Brett Bielema, he's in that defensive meeting. Yeah, gave up more yards in that game than they gave up in any game last year. 416 yeah. yards would have been the second most points they gave up. Level of difficulty ratchets up a lot this week. We've kind of had our eye on this game for a while. They go to Lawrence to take on Kansas, one of the yeah. most improved teams in the country last year. First time Illinois will visit Kansas since 92, as in 1892. I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking Whoa. it changed a little bit since then. You're right? Going back. Yeah, yeah probably least efficient, uh, less efficient ways of getting there. In 1892, they just mm. hitched up the wagons and uh, yeah. got on the yeah. train. Yeah, yep. got on the train. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I'm, I'm guessing. I'm, I'm guessing that wasn't an easy nonstop <laughs> from Champaign to Lawrence, though. Uh, another narrow escape. Minnesota against Nebraska scored 10 points in the final three minutes to win it by three. I think what we're starting to learn, or what we have learned about P.J. Flex teams, they know how to win close games. It's a sign of a good team. He clearly has a good team. That being said, wasn't a great performance. Just kind of figured it out there at the end. What did you learn about the Gophers? Yeah, well, the first thing that jumped at me is culture wins. You know, and that was a game that we talk about – P.J. Fleck, he's always talking about rowing the boat and I'm building the culture, building the culture. Well, that's what – you come back two and a half minutes and score ten points and yeah. win a game, that's because your kids kept believing and they kept laying it on the line for you and they find a way to make enough plays to win that football game. The thing that bothered me a little bit was the, uh, the, the running game. I mean, when I say Minnesota and you close your eyes, you say, oh, we're going to run the ball with Mo and company in years right. past – and it's going to be a play-action pass and a quarterback-friendly type of offense. That didn't happen. Would they have 25 runs for 55 yards? That is not Minnesota football. Right. So that kind of caught me off guard a little bit. I did expect. Now, give Nebraska a little bit of credit. You know, they that you know uh, Tony White, the new uh, uh, coordinator there, he runs that three-five-three defense, and and people, it's very difficult to get a hat on if you're not used to it. Yeah. But I thought that Minnesota would still run the ball a little bit better. Now, on the other side of the ball, Joe Rossi, for all the guys he graduated, what did he graduate? Seven starter. I thought their defense played really good. I mean, really good. They, they created turnovers, uh, interceptions. I, I thought that the defense from Minnesota really was a little bit ahead of where I thought they'd be week one against a Nebraska team that had talent. Joe Rossi's proven himself to be one of the mm, best coordinators absolutely. in the country. He is really, really good. Four turnovers, as you said. Tyler Newbin coming up with a couple of big interceptions. I think it says a lot about Minnesota that you could take away their run game. That's the fewest rushing yards they've had in a win under P.J. Fleck. Mm. And they can still figure out a way to win. Uh, Kaliak Manis had some nice moments in that game. Certainly the, the drive that gave them the, the touchdown. Yes. Uh, to tie things up, a, a beautiful ball, incredible catch, of course, by Daniel Jackson. But lots of like if you're Minnesota. If you're forced to win kind of with your offhand and, and can get it done, that's a, a real positive sign. They got Eastern Michigan this week, a game you can see here on the Big Ten Network. But, again, they've won 17 of their last 24 one-possession games now. It's, it's pretty remarkable. What about Rutgers? They didn't just beat Northwestern. They beat them up. The lines of scrimmage were so dominated by Rutgers yeah. – in this game, and you're starting to see it take shape of what a Greg Schiano coach team is going to look like. This is who he wants to be, just tougher than you. We, we talked about it last week. You and I did on the show that it, it, Greg, with Greg, it's going to be special teams and defense early or maybe all year, you know, for all he cares. Right. But uh, when you took a look at the defense, two interceptions, five sacks, eight tackles for loss, holding Northwestern to 12 yards rushing. Uh, I don't know what more. You, the defense is where he wants it. And offensively, I'll tell you, you know, Gavin Winsat, the quarterback, I, I, and, and having texted with Greg a little bit, you know, he, he, he's right where he needs to be, but they need to be playing games that are close or they have a little bit of a lead. You know, I mean, I think the concern that I have with Gavin personally is if they're two or three touchdowns behind, and they can't be balanced. 
Rutgers needs to be a balanced offense. They need to complement him with being able to run the ball. And right. I don't care how many yards, run the ball, and now his play action passes, his athleticism, he'll make some plays for you. Yeah. And then they're going to come up with plays on, on defense. But 38 minutes possession time, that's hard to do. I mean, that's, uh, that's what they had, you know, and as we know. So two, and, and you know the other thing, I'm, and I'm giving Shiano on a little bit too much love here, maybe. But, uh, <laughs> Come on, he's your guy. He's my guy. But, you know, would they have two drives, 16, 16 plays? 16 plays. Coach, you know how hard it is with no defense to run 16 plays in a row without right. somebody dropping a ball or jumping off sides or right. holding somebody? So that tells me that these, these kids were focused. They really were. To be able to do that twice on any level, high school, junior high, NFL, 16 plays in a row twice and, and not shoot yourself in the foot, that's, that's a disciplined team. Ran 32 plays of the first 37 of the game. So wow. it was 32 yeah. to 5. Two 16-play drives, as you said. And essentially the game was over. I mean, once they went up 14 to nothing, they, they had put it away. I'm with you on Wimson. I think you see that dimension where – if he gets into the open field, he's a tough guy to bring down. He's, yep. a, he's a big fella. Uh, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of positives. Again, we'll see, you know, uh, where they go here from, from here. And, um, you know, you can still look at it and say less than four yards of play. I don't think it'll be overpowering on offense. But they were good enough on defense to be competitive last year. So if you're just a little bit better. Yep. On offense? Just don't fall behind. You're right. If the defense yep. can keep him in games where it's close, like we said, then Winsat will have a, a chance to, to do what he can do best. Good feeling, no doubt, in Piscataway coming off of week one. You've already equaled last year's conference win total. Four new coaches in the Big Ten this year. First time that's happened in seven years. Only one of them managed to win. That was Luke Fickle at Wisconsin. Mentioned Nebraska's close loss. Northwestern's not so close one. Ryan Walters also falling in his Purdue debut, dropped a tough one to Fresno State. Let's go through each of these coaches. I want to start with Fickle, and he was in the best situation in terms of what he inherited at Wisconsin preseason pick to win the West. Has an incredible track record coming from Cincinnati. Took them to the college football playoff a couple of years ago. What did you learn? What did you glean from watching him at his first time at Wisconsin? Well, his team came out obviously ready to play, you know, and that uh, uh, there was no egos. You know, his staff looked at this game and said, what gives us the best chance to win? Uh, we're not going to throw it to try to highlight our passing game. We're not going to blitz to blitz. We're going to do what we have to do to win, and that's what he did. And uh, it, it was a great, solid win. I mean, there's really nothing uh, – that you would say, boy, I wish they would have done more of this. Right. So I think for the first game out of the block, he's got to be happy with his team. He's got to be happy with the effort and, and his assistant coaches. I mean, the game plan they had was was right on point, what they needed to do. Not, you, you don't go week three and decide, okay, we're going to be physical running team now. You know, if you want to run the football and be physical, you that's what you got to do first, right out of the chute, and that's what they did. And Fickle had the advantage of having coached them in the bowl game, so he's got a lot of familiarity with the players. And then, look, he's had a great run here. I mean, yep. you he look back over doing. the last five seasons, the only coaches who have won more games than him are Nick Saban, Dabo Sweeney, and um, uh, Kirby Smart. Yeah, so that's a, that's a pretty good list yeah, right it, there it, of, it, uh, you know, guy won the last two national championships and, and – you know, Dabo and and uh, and Nick. So good, good company to be mentioned in. Uh, Matt Rule also a hugely successful college coach. Temple and and Baylor, of course, had the NFL in the interim. This is a tough way to lose. I mean, we were talking about it from Minnesota's point of view. This is a difficult when you're on the other side of it because first of all, you have a chance to have a really positive debut. Second of all, this is what's been happening to them, right? right? Like this is the recent history with them of losing these games of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. And now you got to face the media and face the fans after having it happen again. What did you take from kind of how he handled it after the game and, and just what we saw from him? Well, you know, he's going to handle it fine. Uh, I, 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 they're obviously the disappointment, uh, 
you know, here we go again mentality, you know, the only way to change that is to win one of these close games at the end, you know, and Scott Frost, Scott Frost was saying that for years, but you got to go out and you got to do it. Right. The biggest concern I had, I, I was fine with what their defense did. Offensively right now, Matt Rule, you know, he went out and he got Jeff Sims from Georgia Tech. Yeah. to come in, who was known as kind of a runner, not as much passer. Yeah. And now you come in and you throw three interceptions. He was uh, also known as a bit of a turnover problem. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And the, lo- the longest pass you have is a trick play. So if, if I'm Matt Roll and he's looking to make, make some noise in the Big Ten Conference, you got to solve how you're going to score points, and you got to solve that quarterback position. And if it's Jeff Sims going forward, I know it's just one game. If it is Jeff Sims going forward, David, you have to make some adjustments on what you're going to try to do with him. Yeah, put the ball in harm's way a few times too many, and ultimately the turnovers are what cost Nebraska this game. You can see a lot of the positives with Sims. He ran for nearly 100 yards. Yep. He is a big guy. He is tough to bring down. But passing left a little bit to be desired here, and it, it certainly limits what they can do. And, and again, really difficult game coming up against Colorado. We're going to get more into that. And just a difficult road in general. I mean, if you're comparing, and I, it's inevitable, I think, to a certain extent, to kind of compare first-year coaches, you compare the situation that Luke Fickle inherited yep. versus what Matt Rule inherited with six straight seasons where you didn't make it to a bowl game. Like, it's tough. It's, yeah. it's a challenging spot to be and, in. And, you know, as I'm watching that game, I'm sitting there thinking, Matt has the opportunity to win a close game at the end on the road, under the lights, on national TV, and from a standpoint of walking up in front of your team and saying, that's why what we've been telling you, and that's why we do what we, we've been doing, guys. Now we got to turn. Now you understand that feeling. And for it to, to fall apart like that, that's a tough one. We'll see. See if they can get it back on track. Again, schedule's not easy. Get Northern Illinois after that. Northern Illinois just went to – Boston College in one. So these are these are challenging times here for uh, for Matt Rule early on. Speaking of challenging schedules, uh, Ryan Walters, you get to open with Fresno State, which is, oh, as we know, toughy. I mean, they had yep. won nine straight games coming in. Defensively had a lot of problems. Uh, the, the secondary was a struggle. Now, this is where he's really good. And we know how good he was at Illinois last year. They Led the nation in scoring defense. He had three defensive backs picked in the first three rounds of the draft. But yep. what did you take from the debut? Yeah, you know, we talked about it last week on the show. And my comment was, if I could talk to Ryan, I would say, don't lose sight of why you got this job. You got this job because of your defensive expertise when you were at Illinois and, right. and beyond that. So that needs to be your focus. There's going to be a lot of leaks in the dam. You know, I got to stop this leak. I got to stop this. Put, you, you, you got to kind of put that aside. And you got to get focused on the defense. And, and they had five leads in this game. Five times Purdue had the lead. And they couldn't hold it. That's on your defense. You, you, we can't, you know, soft shoot us any other way. So if I'm, if I'm Ryan, I am in with those defensive players and coaches and we got to tighten this up, you know, and the, and the offense will take care of itself. They did enough uh, offensively. I mean, right. they, they did enough good things there that I wouldn't be concerned with that. It's all about the defense. And Fresno, like you just said, is a heck of a football They're good. They won 10 games in a row yeah, now. No, no question. Yes, and they got good coaches and good players. So uh, they, they drew a tough opener. There's no question about that. But And, and now your reward is he gets to go to Virginia Tech, which yeah. is somewhat of a challenging place but, to but play. I, but I come back yeah. to this, that we had the lead five no, times, and we got to make yes. a stop. Yes. we got to make, make a stop. stop. 371 passing yards. Right. They're not going to win you a lot of games. That's what they gave up. I'm not sure anyone nationally is in a tougher spot than David Braun at Northwestern. We all know about the turmoil that went on in the offseason. Probably didn't have a great roster to begin with, frankly. Open with a conference game on the road against Rutgers. Yep. It seemed to get better, at least at least defensively, as the game went on. They were able to get off the field a little bit. But, you know, the offense, as it has been for years, stuck in neutral. And, and they're with the same scheme. And it's, yeah. it's just a tough spot. And, that, and with Shiano and Rutgers and all their movement, and you graduate, what, four out of five offensive linemen are gone. I mean, the, the running game. Somehow they have to be able to run it. Their quarterbacks, hey, I, Ben Bryant went in, didn't do bad. You know what I mean? He threw a couple of picks, which you can't do. But to have any quarterback 
function at a, at a solid level, you can't be third and long. You, you can't be hitting in the backfield. You have to be third down and manage, manageables. And by that, I mean you got to be able to run it and do stuff on first and second down. So now it's third and five. And a kid like this, you know, with a younger offensive line, now they have a chance to convert and move the ball down the field and not have to punt almost every time. So uh, that's the challenge there. But I thought defensively, I, I really did. I mean, they went back to that old 4-3 uh, that they ran, and uh, I thought they played hard. I mean, they had a chance to make plays. The quarterback got away from them a few times, but it wasn't because of lack of effort, that's for sure. No, offense is just, like, you can't win. They've scored 29 points in their last five conference games combined. I mean, I just, I don't know how you're going to win. They've got UTEP this week at home. They are considered the underdog coming into this game. That's a really big game for them just to get some sort of confidence and end that losing streak. The Big Ten Players of the Week are out. You see the Offensive Player of the Week, Drew Aller from Penn State. A couple guys came up with big picks. Miles Scott, Tyler Newbin winning the defensive honors. And you see the other two winners as well. That's all well and good. But I mentioned going to break, there's a new award in the Big Ten. And this is the one that people are aspiring to. Wani's winner of the week. Where are you going? A top secret process. I'll tell you where I'm going. And I felt so good about this pick. I did not wear my pit ring. Okay, I put that in a drawer. I wore Miami ring. Penn State, James Franklin, the best coaching job, his best performance, in my opinion, of all Big Ten games this week. I mean, when you when you don't turn it over, you don't have a, you got one penalty, you score, throwing it with a new quarterback, you run the ball, your defense comes up with negative plays, holds them to three points to the last part of the ten seconds. Outstanding, James. Good job. First ever Wani winner of the week. It's like Jay Berwanger. No one will ever forget it. See you tomorrow. <laughs>